curtsy. Paul, thanks so much for being here. That's a really great, um, it's just a great suit. It's a great tooth suit. <laughs> it's a wonderful poster. It really is. Um, there was a workshop, guys in Toronto, who built, who built that suit, and each tooth was, mold, it was a molded piece of silicone rubber. And, it, and they just, you know, they just stitched it on like this. And it's actually a young woman inside. The, the tooth child is a young, is a young woman. <laughs> yeah, they found a really, a really great actress who also is a dancer. And she had the kind of, she had the right build. You know, we can't find, you know, we can't sort of, we're already working with so many children. Uh, we tried to find someone who was kind of a little older and who could work longer hours, because as you know, kids, you know, they've got a very strict policy about how long they can work before they have to go back to school. And um, yeah, it was a really charming woman. <laughs> you know, 19-year-old woman, and she, uh, there were many scenes where she had to put her, <laughs> her sort of toothed hand in my mouth as far as she could. And then other scenes that you'll see later on in the season where a guy falls asleep and she comes and sucks on my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm married and I, I just, I don't know, she's 19 and I, the whole thing just seemed like a horror, a horror film. <laughs> it well, it is, it is kind so of a horror, it is kind of a horror film. Yeah. Um, you, you haven't actually done that much TV about, outside of the short time that you did on Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as an actor, you're pretty committed to sort of working with directors that you're interested in or, 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 or whose work that you really like. And, I think what's amazing about Channel Zero is that it's all uh, essentially one director. It's, it's, it's his vision for the majority of, of this first season. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. It's Craig, it's Craig McNeil and the cinematographer Noah Greenberg and the show's creator Nick Antosca. And his, his idea was let's make a sort of a, a six-hour-long episode film. Um, it just to sort of you know, each, each section should sort of have a consistent tone, at least consistent to a certain vision. Um, and, you know, it was a way of not having, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. I mean, you, you know, you just have to buy, buy into a strong enough vision. Is and that what drew you to it, was sort of being a part of a vision rather than being a part of a, a, a series? I, I think it's something that I can wrap my brain around. I think, you know, I've, I've done a few TV shows, and... The, the, the longevity is something that's hard for me to understand. Because um, when my friends and I got out of film school, we were making you know, these, these uh, a couple features kind of on our own. Um, two, sorry to interrupt, two classic features. You made George Washington and All the Real Girls, two of the best independent films of, of that era. Which we were pretty sure was not going to be the takeaway. <laughs> I remember when we got into the, uh, when, when George Washington got into the Berlin Film Festival, um, my parents are adamantly anti-credit card. And, uh, I mean, you can't be these days. But, but at the time, they were like, don't ever, you know, pay in cash. You know, pay your own way, everything else. And I remember I called my mother on the phone and said, we're going to Berlin. Um, I'm going to take out a credit card to buy a plane ticket with a $1,500 <laughs> limit. That was in the days when I was going to the ATM and pulling out, like, $20 at a time. And I'm like... <laughs> um, so it's like twenty dollars. Yeah, woohoo! Like, and like, not, week. like, do you want to check your balance? And you're like, no, 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 no. Don't check that balance. Um, I know it's low. I don't need to. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and we we and I, I was I said to my mom, I said, you know, I'm going to get this credit card and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay it off because I'm convinced that we'll never get a chance to go to the Berlin Film Festival again, and this is our big chance, and that'll be that. And then I just started going every couple of years after that. Um, it was a really surprising to us that the, that this thirty thousand dollar movie that we made in North Carolina t took off. George Washington only cost thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, we put it. Yeah, that's unbelievable. The, the production costs were thirty thousand, and then I think once it was picked up, obviously the distributor, you know, put in some more. But that's incredible to me because you watch that movie, and I've, I've seen that movie multiple times, and I've always I've always thought the budget was much much greater than that because it looks so beautiful. Yeah, we got free. There's a guy called Joe Dunton who, who has a camera house in North Carolina on the coast. And he, uh, the cinematographer Tim Orr went to him and said, you know, would you donate lenses and a camera to this, this project we're doing? And, and he said yes. 
And so, so it looked great because we got some things for free. Now you went to you went to school with all those guys with with David and 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 Tim and even I think Danny Danny McBride yeah, as well. Yeah. Were you when you came out? Were you wanting to be an actor or were you sort of acting in these films as sort of as part of the filmmaking process with your friends? Yeah, uh, the latter. <laughs> I mean, I, I was studying editing in, in film school, and I I thought that what I would do was cut documentaries. It's kind of what I was interested in, and that's kind of what I thought I was going to do. And we had this sort of, this pod of our little sort of filmmaking crew, and um, we would make these short films on the weekends, and we didn't really know any actors, and some of the actors that we did know who were in the drama school were kind of, it, it, sort of cut of a different cloth. I mean, we were watching films like Badlands and Killer of Sheep and all this weird kind of very naturalistic stuff. And it's hard to talk to, you know, somebody who's in the drama school who's learning, you know, Into the Woods and 42nd Street and I don't know what else. Um, it's hard for them to, you know, get them to <laughs> settle down. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't knowledge enough directors to get them to not, you know, when they walk across a room, it's just, It's like no, dude. Just we're just. It's just a. We're just a connecting shot. Like we're just walking across the room. Like it's not. You don't have to solve a mystery, but you know between this door and that door. Like we're just trying to get you in the kitchen. But I need a motivation for it. Stuff like this. <laughs> um, and I had started doing some of these directing exercises when we were in our directing classes while I was doing um, my editing concentration, and. I just, you know, my, I just got picked a couple times to be the guy, and then I would, um, we would do these short films, and oftentimes what my friends would have me do is sort of like write my own dialogue based on some wacky story about some, you know, growing up in North Carolina and my crazy group of friends that I hung out with when I was down there. And I would write my dialogue and sort of, um, sort of stitch it into the rest of the story. So, so I would have my, you know, the other person would have their line here. I would sort of start my dialogue in relation to that line, sort of tell kind of a wacky story, and then come back at the end and, and stitch it back in. And, you know, when we, we got the money together to make George Washington, I, I just was, you know, I never, I never had thought much about trying to be an actor. I didn't know I could think that. I sort of, I didn't know I was allowed to think those things. Um, I feel like this, the, the imagination of my ceiling was very low, actually. Um, and then we, we made this film. I kind of write, did the same thing, sort of wrote a lot of my dialogue. A lot of the stories that I tell in George Washington are stories from my growing up. And um, we got into the Berlin Film Festival. We got into New York Film Festival. Um, all of a sudden, I had an agent, and I was you know, an actor which was ironic because I was trying to get away from actors by, <laughs> you know, by, by being the, the actor in these films. And, and then you become this, and then you're the star of all the real girls. And then yeah. at, at that point, I think it, it, it opens up maybe even more doors for you because that film sort of took off a little bit and you were the star of it. Yeah, yeah. Did sort of not wanting to be an actor or not wanting to sort of be around actors initially not not around actors, excuse me, but you know, not just sort of not. It's just it's just not a community I had very much contact with, you right? Know? And 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 the only contact that I had with it was like drama school, college drama school stuff, where people are running around in in you know black turtlenecks and fencing, and I just <laughs> making a you know making a big spectacle of I, themselves when they come around in the cafeteria, and I just think like, oh god. I couldn't agree with you more. I went to film school, and there was a drama school there, and I kept my distance as much. Right, as right, right. Well, I wanted to hang out and watch. Badlands, Killer of Sheep, or David Lynch movies with my friends. Right, right, right. Um, but when you started to become an actor and well known for being an actor, did it give you? Did you have an odd relationship with the profession? Did you have? Absolutely. I, I mean, I still do very much so. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't act a lot. I say no to stuff to, a, a lot. Um, what makes you say yes? It, it's. It used to be just about the script and the character. Now I feel like it's more about um, the experience. You know, I might say yes to a script that that it's not kind of completely faultless. Um, and by yes, I mean to say that either someone offers it to me, 
um, and I say yes, or more likely, I'm I'm out there auditioning like anybody else. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I don't work because I didn't get the thing that I wanted to 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 be in, and they went with somebody you know who has a higher profile. Um, Keanu Reeves. No, I remember there was a moment when, like, I, you know, there was a moment a few years ago when Owen Wilson was was kind of massive, and I was going on for, for this part, and then they said that sort of Owen Wilson, and I thought, well, of course you're going to go with him, you know, or or you know, you, you know, you and McGregor swoops in, and I just think like, well, of course you're going to go with him. I mean, the capital investment to make a movie is so large that anything you can do to mitigate the risk of losing that capital investment, I mean, you can't blame financiers for wanting to take, and if that means somebody has more name recognition in foreign markets than I do, which is, you know, lots of people. Um, you know, I, I don't have any bad blood about that. But nowadays, I, I, I think I choose um, projects, or I, let's say I, tr I throw my hat in the ring to, sort of to be chosen, I guess, um, based on, you know, where we're shooting, um, the other technicians involved, uh, the other cast involved, um, the things that you can, you know, you try to know as much as you can before you go, and the rest is a crapshoot, you know. When I watch Channel Zero, I'm watching it basically for the first time like anybody else is. Um, you know, I'm watching it waiting to see. The first pass is usually you're sort of braced and, and sort of nervous about the fact that, like, you know, what, what's in and what's out. And the second time you watch it, which sometimes you just don't because it's not like I'm at home alone watching my own films and... <laughs> yeah, so what do we have here? Elizabethtown? Yeah, exactly. Let me just, yeah, um, let's go down the list here. Um, I don't do that for fun. Um, but, uh, you know, the second time you watch it, it, you sort of like allow the movie to be sort of what it is. The first time, it's a question of you realizing what it's not. You know, you had preconceived notions about what, you know, what you were going to be involved in. Then you see the editing process. And the first, you know, the first uh, viewing is always kind of a heartbreak because you think like, ah, you know, that scene didn't make it or this doesn't make it or, you know, this monologue wasn't presented in a way that I had originally, you know, perceived. Or like, huh, you went with me doing that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, no. My wife was like, why, why, why would they choose that take of you? And I say, this is what I, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. But, but the second time you see it, you kind of let it, let it be what it is, you know? You kind of release your ego and, you know, you kind of like, you're, you'd stop being nervous and you say, this, this thing sort of needs to live and breathe on its own. And, and the second time, um, you know, the second time we saw the daughter was like the time when it sort of, I really started to enjoy it because I thought like, you know, you're not constantly picking out, you know, your double chin or the fact that your hair is going gray or you, you know, haven't been to the gym in 12 years. Years. It's hard to not do those things if you don't have control or are a direct part of the editing process. Because if you're actually in there being able to go, let's try this or let's do this, then all you can really focus on are sort of like thin or neuroses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 it's and and look, when I get hired as an actor, I just you know like yes, I studied editing and yes, I went to film school and I've got ideas and opinions about things, but that's not what I'm getting hired for. I feel like I'm getting hired for my instincts. And I feel like I'm getting, getting hired to give, um, give them options in the editing room. You know, I have a certain bandwidth that I think is, you know, I feel like the character sort of lives in this broad, you know, bandwidth. And anything outside of that, I say, ah, I don't know, that doesn't feel like my guy. Um, and then there's a discussion about it. But I feel like within that sort of bandwidth, I, I want to give the, the editor options because you never know. You know, you're cutting you know, a 64-page script into 44 minutes. That's extremely hard. Um, and I also have kind of a, a quibble with actors who, who go on about this sense of authorship they have about their performance. And I mean, I spend four years in film school like turning really shitty performances into hopefully passable, good performances. I mean, it's, it, the power you have over performance in editing is extraordinary. Yeah, I, I heard an actor say recently that they, that they themselves found that acting in movies and film is the most lauded but least important part of the process. In a way it is. In a way it is. I think so. Um, 
like I said, I just want to give I just want to give the cook ingredients. You know, ho hopefully high quality, fresh ingredients, so he can make a great meal for the people that are watching. Great from the market. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, farm to table. <laughs> um, and uh, but but I but but I really f I, what I enjoy about filmmaking um, is the symphonic process. You know, to me, it's like we're it's it, it's almost like an expeditionary force. You know, we're climbing Mount Everest. And we have this finite amount of time. We have a finite budget. We have these different groups of people who have different disciplines and different, you know, sort of professions. You know, you do what you do, and I do what I do, and we're all kind of, you know, headed up the same mountain together in a way that supports each other. And I think it's that group effort and the collaboration that lately I've found is 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 really what I enjoy. I mean, acting, yeah, I enjoy it. But what I really enjoy is the thrust, you know, this team effort of it's making a like film. Almost like you like movies and you like the process, and acting is how you get to it's sort of maintain. It's just the thing that happens. Part of it. Yeah. yeah. Because when I got an agent, I thought, okay, well, this is unexpected, and I, look, I, I guess I don't suck. I mean, I had a teacher who said, "You don't suck," and I was like, "Great." <laughs> Um, you have like a natural, uh, it's a weird thing to say in front of someone, you have a, a very natural charisma in front of the camera that I think is, is noticeable, especially in all the real girls, which is like, you hadn't been acting much, it's your first movie, and you're the lead in that movie. And, and based on my life, you know, written by Dave and I, like a couple of years before when we got dumped by the girls we loved. <laughs> so it was pretty, you know, playing yourself as an understatement. But yeah, like, I think, I mean, I don't know if this is applicable to the rest of the world or not, but I feel like because I, I don't, I've never, you know, burned to act in the way that, that I see other people burning to act. Um, I've got uh, great friends, you know, people like, like Sam Rockwell or Marin Ireland, and I, I don't know if they burn to act, but I really do think they found what they should be doing. You know, it's really nice when you know, it's, I think of like the, Ma the Michael Jordan example, you know, I think about the first day that, you know, a basketball rolled to the foot of a young Michael Jordan. And I just love that these, you know, this thing fit together so well. His brain and his body and this discipline, just, it just matched so effortlessly. And I feel like there are people like that. I don't think I'm like that. I think I'm good at a couple things, you know, here and there. I, you know, I, I know a little bit about a lot of different things. Um, but this is just kind of what I'm doing. And I feel like because I don't, because I'm not holding on, you know, so tightly, you know, for my life, I feel like I can go in and meet with producers and say, look, you've got a great project, I'd love to be involved, but it's not going to kill me if I, I, I don't say this. <laughs> but I think this, like, it's not going to kill me not to be involved, you know? It's not, it's not, you know, it's not, this is not something I have to have to do because I'm not that interested in playing somebody's buddy in a romantic comedy unless it's really fantastic you know I, I feel like I don't need to act just to act but when the opportunity comes obviously it's exciting and I'm uh, grateful and everything else channel zero um before uh we move to audience questions but maybe we should like uh, let people know a little bit more about the show it's on sci-fi it's this really uh, creepy very well-made show that sort of is inspired by these things called creepy pastas, right? I've, I've read the Wikipedia for this several times and I still don't totally get exactly what they are. They're like horror stories that are told through online forums? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly correct. I, 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 this is a whole genre that I didn't know about either. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the scripts were so, you know, we were talking backstage about some of the movies that we saw when we were younger that might not hold up as great films, but somehow, you know, it's that movie that you saw on HBO at somebody else's house that is it's rated R. It's not, it's not kid-friendly, but you were a kid sort of, you know, glued to the set thinking, I really shouldn't be watching this, but there's something that sticks with you. Um, and the scripts for Channel Zero, for Candle Cove, reminded me of those, you know, 11, 12 year old moments where I was watching something and riveted to it and knowing this is like, it's for kids, but not for kids. Right, because this is sort of about kids, but the kids in this are vicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's something going on with this television show and, and these kids are, are being, you know, influenced. There are a couple jokes in the, in, the, in, the, in the show where I say, you know, people, are, I'm, I'm a child, I play a child psychologist, so people are asking me why these kids are doing 
you know, strange things, and I just kind of keep on saying, it's too, too much TV. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I can't believe that I'm kind of turning into the per person who thinks like, yeah, yeah too much TV is bad. <laughs> I'm, tur I'm turning into my parents. Do um, you think too much TV is bad? Absolutely, sure. I mean, you know, the stack of books beside my bed is like this. I've read, you know, a third of all of them. But, um, well, it's been impossible to read in the last couple months. It's been impossible it's been, to do anything but like look at Twitter and the news. Personally, I have a stack of books as well. A little bit, yeah. Every night that I'm like, oh, I'm going to read this book, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to check to see if uh, someone had said anything crazy today. Okay, yeah. now I'll try to read a book. Yeah, yeah. I, hopefully it'll die down. But yeah, like that, that's, I mean, I struggle with that. I struggle with, I really only love two television shows. What are they? Uh, Frontline and America's Funniest Videos. I've heard you say this before. It's, How do you think just, Alfonso's doing as the new host? I'm not. I'm big on Tom Bergeron. Uh, so you're... you're I, 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 Alfonso is too... Um, it's too actor -y for me. Mm -hmm. Came from drama school. <laughs> Look, he's got a great shtick. I mean, clearly he's doing very well. So if you have Saget, Bergeron... Bergeron. You go Bergeron. Fugelsang. <laughs> A, a, a great, very smart guy, but not my favorite host. Um, but yeah, you Tom Bergeron. Host funniest home videos. Yeah, with, with Daisy Fuentes. Oh. There was a co. There was a co-hosting. Sorry, I know I've seen a few episodes. Um, <laughs> there, there was a co-hosting moment. It's very far sides of the spectrum, like the highest of highbrow yeah. online and the lowest of lowbrow. America's funniest home videos. It's it's what I aspire to. And there's nothing in between. Is there anything in between? I, I, you know, I think like everybody else, I get, I get, I go on these jags of like kind of these YouTube holes where like I, I got really interested. Well, for a moment, I was really interested in this show called the Great, the Great British Baking Show. Oh yeah, people love that show. <laughs> I don't know anything about baking. It. I mean, I, I know that every time I would finish, I would run to the bodega and just like grab whatever black and white cookies there on that because it, it just baked goods for an hour. Um, but there was something really lovely about it. I don't know if it was a salve for some of the shit that's going on right now in the world, but it was like this very multicultural show. People, they're all British, but you know, there was you know, a young Muslim woman won one episode, and people are all different colors and all different uh, religions, all British, but, and they were all really, it was a, it was a competition show where everybody really, where, where every, everyone cried when someone got kicked off. It was just so, so lovely, and I, I, I feel like I needed I needed that, and I really got into it. I, I didn't come away with any baking. I, I still don't know how to bake, but I just I devoured two episodes or two seasons. Sorry. Um, but before it opened up to the audience for questions, you have a, a movie that you're also uh, talking about here called The Daughter, which is this uh, beautiful film that you made that has Jeffrey Rush in it, Sam Neill. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved with this project? Well, there, it's an interesting story. There was a there was a, a woman called Jan Chapman who is a very famous, well known, great. Uh, 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 um, she's she's just a great Australian producer, and it was actually before I went to film school. I saw my parents and I went to go see a movie called The Piano, Jane Campion's The Piano, like 1993, I think. Um, and before then, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I didn't really care. Um, and then I saw that movie and I thought, I'm gonna go to film school. I found out there was a film school in North Carolina that I could afford, I went there, and years, in, you know, I studied editing, you know, I, I, then I kind of circuitously found my way into acting, and years and years later I did Assassination of Jesse James, which played at the Venice Film Festival, um, and, sh and Jane Campion was a juror, and she, she called me up. And I took the phone call, I was living in Los Angeles, I took the phone call, and I had a poster of the piano in my kitchen, and I was standing in my kitchen looking at the poster for the piano, talking to Jane Campion on the phone, and she was doing a new project. I didn't tell, I didn't tell her, because <laughs> I didn't want to sound like an ass kisser, but um, I was just a massive fan. I mean, she, was, so she and Jan, this, this, her producer, were sort of my heroines. I kind of thought, like, who are these crazy ladies that are doing this amazing work? Like, this is great. Um, and she called me about this John Keats movie that she was making, and she said, do you think you can play like an overweight, bearded, you know, Scottish poet? And I was like, no acting, you know, no acting school, no training whatsoever, like, sure. This <laughs> is, is Bright, is this bright, it's bright, bright Star, Star yeah. yeah. So we went to England and made Bright Star, and 
all of a sudden I was acting for the woman whose film kind of started me down this path. And I brought her my, the, the, um, the movie stub from this small theater in like South Asheville, North Carolina. You had the movie stub? I brought the, the movie wow. stub to her just to say like, you know, you, you, you know, you got me started on this journey and then here we are. Um, and, and we made that film and it did very well. And, and, uh, and I started a relationship with Jan Chapman, um, the producer, who's just, the, who's just I, I can't believe to say this, but she's a friend of mine now, which I think is, you know, it's like becoming friends with, I don't know, you know, some, some hero of yours. And we just email, it's just so odd. Um, but either way, we, we kept in touch and she was making this film um, based on an Ibsen play. Um, and she had, a, a, you know, her cast was, was set except for this one character. And she called me up and asked me if I would do it. And I read the script and it was, it was, it was maybe one of the best scripts I've ever read. Um, and I said, absolutely. And it was a tragedy. And I thought that was really interesting because I, you, you don't, they're, they're, you know, you don't see many classic tragedies anymore. You know, people want that up ending, um, which I guess I understand, but. Um, but this was a straight up, you know, bad shit happens and it's my fault. And, uh, and it was interesting to me. And obviously the cast was, you know, these are people that I can learn a lot from and I would do anything with Jan. So it was an opportunity to go down there and work on something new. Absolutely. Uh, let's open up to the audience for questions. Who has questions? Anything, uh, anything. Hey, Paul. Uh, hey. So I have uh, two questions. One, uh, would you eventually go back to editing uh, as opposed to acting? And, no. And uh, the other one, uh, uh, one of my favorite movies that you were in was Lars and the Real Girl. What, mm -hmm. what was it like working on that movie? How did you get involved? Um, well, the editing thing, it, you know, editing is a tough road. You know, you're spending about 10 years as an assistant and an apprentice. Um, and then you start to cut things, you know, 10 years in a, in a room, you know, a dark room with another editor. Um, so... So by the time I had acted in a few films, it was sort of, also the technology had kind of passed me, you know what I mean? Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't learn the Avid system. I learned a system back in the day called Lightworks, which was a competitive nonlinear editing system. And that's now, I, I think, basically defunct. Um, I even have that too, where I learned Final Cut and now everyone's on Premiere. Right, And I'm yeah. kind of like, I guess I'll cut what I make on Final Cut 7, I don't, okay. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I, 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 I learned, I didn't learn the keyboard-based nonlinear editing. Um, and it's, it was dumb luck, I was just assigned that computer because our school was given like four computers and two of us got Lightworks and two of us got Avid. And the people <laughs> who got Avid are, are working. <laughs> and I'm not in the, that side of the business anymore and the other guy, I think he's doing something else. Um, but Lars and the Real Girl was another one of those uh, a great scripts that was floating around Los Angeles when I was there. And it just was, and I don't audition very well, but I, I think I auditioned very well for that one. I mean, there was a lot I, I could, I, I have a brother and I don't know, there was a lot of relative stuff in that script that I didn't feel I had to stretch very hard to access. And it was a standard process. I read the script. I had an audition. I met with the director. I had another audition. Um, and, uh, and, and we started production in Toronto. And I think the biggest takeaway from, from that film for me was becoming friends and working with Emily Mortimer, who played my wife. And she's still a good friend of mine. And I she just. She's the best. She's awesome. Gorgeous, uh, clearly gorgeous woman, but also kind of completely down to earth and sort of disgusting in a weird way. Like she's got gross jokes and she's just a great, great hang and a great woman to work with, great person to work with. Um, and she and I really relied on each other on that one. Um, I, I mean, maybe she relied on me. I relied on her quite a bit. We rehearsed ourselves. We did a lot of um, sort of uh, running lines in in either one of ours apartments, and uh, and that was the first movie where I realized how um, helpful a great co-star c c can be. I mean, I feel like she, her, you know, had she not been there, I, I don't know what I would have done. Um, but but the big takeaway on Lars and the Real Girl was was Emily and being able to work with her. 
What was the big takeaway on Elizabethtown, which is a movie I've seen multiple times? Mo more than multiple. I mean, I, I watch Elizabethtown quite regularly. That's odd. That's, <laughs> that's, I know it is. That's odd. Um, the big takeaway, I mean, you know, I, I worked my ass off for that movie. You're really um, good in it. I, I appreciate it. I wanted to be. I really wanted to be good in it. Um, or one of the shining lights in that movie. Yeah, and a lot of and a, yeah, and a lot of and a lot of blown out blown out lights. Um, <laughs> I, I you know I had to learn. I played drums a little bit when I was growing up, but I had to learn to play drums and sing at the same time. And then, my backing band was my morning jacket. Which, you know, have you, do you guys know my morning? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty hard. successful. Yeah, big band. They don't. They don't. Yeah, they don't back very, very many <laughs> uh, people. Um, and I just remember, you know, and I just remember, um, you know, playing the song "Freebird" a million times in front of a massive studio, um, with a, you know, with this like seven foot wingspan flying like paper mache bird on fire. <laughs> coming over us. Um, I love this movie. And then, and then the sprinkler system starts, so all of a sudden we're drenched in, um, uh, we're drenched in, in water, and Cameron's just screaming, like, keep playing, keep playing, scream. And I'm like, scream, scream. He's like, yeah, scream. And I'm like, ah, you know? And, and <laughs> it was just one of those moments where you look around, and in the moment you see, you know, my morning jacket thrashing around. You see this bird on fire above you. Um, you know, you were drenched in water. I'm playing drums. I'm screaming, and I just think, like, I, I, you know, thank God I don't work for an insurance company or something. You know, I just <laughs> thought, I, I just thought, like, this is okay. You know, um, but yeah, that was a that was that was my first sort of like big budget movie experience. Did you like it? The the big budget experience? Um, yeah. I at that point I felt like um, at any moment I was going to be found out and. Right. I felt like someone who was sitting in first class, but I had a coach ticket, and I was just trying to be small. And as the lady goes with a clipboard up and down the line, making sure the people are in the right seats, and she gets to me and she goes, um, and I go, sorry, and I just like <laughs> like go towards the back of the plane. I felt very much that I was going to be found out on that one. Um, I was very, I was very kind of yes sir, no sir, um, just happy to be invited. And I still kind of feel like that, but these days. You know, these days I try to carve out a little more, you know, I mean, I'm very much a team player, but these days I'm trying to carve out a little more space for me to actually give some, put some thought into my acting, you know, actually sort of do what I'm there to do. And, and you know, if I need to do, you know, it used to be that, that I would never ask for an extra take. You know, if the director might say, do you want to do it again? i say, no, 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 let's just keep moving, keep moving. And oftentimes I, I do, do the same thing. But every now and again these days, I think like, wait a second, like I'm gonna, you know, I'm hired for a reason, you know, there's a reason I'm here. It took me a long time to think that, you know, there's a place at this fancy table for for me. And now I'm starting to get the idea that like, you know, I, I I'm I'm here for a reason. Why why why, you know, you take a little extra time to make sure that I'm, you know, giving the best I can, and then let's move on. <laughs> because time and money is always such a, you know, you guys know this. I mean, time, you know, short films, and it's always about time, and it's always about money. And how do we put, how do we jam in as many quality, kind of fun, playful moments in a process that should be very fun and very playful um, amid all this, you know, pressure that this lack of time and lack of money puts us in? Absolutely. Uh, Channel Zero airs tonight on Sci-Fi, right? Is Tuesday night, Tuesday? Tuesday nights at what time? Uh, nine. <laughs> I'm seeing it for the, you know, I'm seeing episode three for the first time tonight, so. It's so good. It's such a creepy, great show. It's, there's nothing else like it on television. Paul, thank you so much for being here, man. It's been thanks a pleasure for, having you. Thanks for having me. Thank I you. Really, I really appreciate it.